Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the April 14th, 2020 regular meeting of the Westchester Trustees. Um, Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yeah, Mrs. Becker. Here. Mr. Wong. Here. Mr. Welch. Here. Let's stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance. This is normally our first citizens comments portion of the meeting, but due to our shelter in place order, we will be doing questions at the end, or at, at our second citizens comments that were sent to us online. Um, so tonight we're gonna kick off uh, our meeting with a presentation from Fire Chief Prins on our current local response to the COVID-19 crisis. Good afternoon, thanks for the opportunity to again brief you on um, the township's response to COVID-19. Um, pulled some numbers down again this afternoon. Uh, so it looks like globally, worldwide, there are 1,970,225 confirmed cases and 124,544 deaths. Within the United States, there are 603,417 confirmed cases and 25,073 deaths. Ohio has 7,280 confirmed cases with 324 deaths. And right here in Butler County, we have 124 confirmed cases and three deaths. I can tell you that uh, I'm in constant communication with um, Jennifer Baylor, the Butler County Health Commissioner, and she updates me almost daily on cases that we have here within Westchester. So we're able to update our data and our CAD so that our responders are aware of those addresses in the event we have to respond. It gives us a little bit um, extra information so that we are extra prepared with the proper PPE. As we enter and work through the predicted surge, we remind all Westchester residents to remain vigilant in their efforts to social distance, wearing cloth masks in public, and practice frequent hand washing and disinfection routines at home. All Westchester departments have and continue to take appropriate measures per the CDC guidance to limit the spread of the virus to protect staff and the public. We limit exposure via home from work, office, so office social distancing, and temperature monitoring practices. Thankfully, to date, each department staff has remained healthy thus far, and we are prepared to respond to any emergency to serve the public. Westchester remains and is prepared to face a surge and continue to provide essential government and emergency services. Westchester Township is very, very appreciative of all the PPE and food donations that we have received. And we work to continue to build our PPE stockpile to get us through this crisis. As of today, all departments have an ample supply of PPE to get us through the next several weeks, depending upon the impact, the total impact of the surge. We continue to seek vendors and receive donations of PPE to get us through this crisis. All personnel time and expenditures, as mentioned last time, uh, relative to the COVID-19 are being tracked for federal and state reimbursements. We continue to receive updates from the EMA, reference these reimbursements, and we will work to ensure that we capture and recruit our costs where appropriate. As of yesterday, we have received a stimulus check of $29,157.52 from uh, Health and Human Services, Medicare, um, as part of the CARES Act President Trump re recently signed into law. So as of today, the Westchester Township Emergency Service Delivery remains strong. We are confident our policies and procedures are helping keep the spread of the virus in check, which in turn keeps our employees healthy and available to serve. That's the update. I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Mr. Welch, Mr. Wong, any questions? I appreciate all the good work you have done. Perfect, thank well you. Done. Good, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Well done. Let's move on to our action items this evening. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve trustee meeting minutes for March 24th, 2020. I'll so move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? 
Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yeah, Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Um, I'll <clears throat> approve, I'll entertain a motion to approve payment of bills. I should move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Um, Mr. Wong? Yes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Burks. Uh, requisitions greater than 7,500. <clears throat> Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, tonight we have uh, nine requisitions, greater than 7,500. Uh, the first is for MP Digital LLC in, in the amount of uh, $13,065.75 to provide professional services, software, and training for Laserfish. Uh, this is CIP 517. The administration continually works on uh, several electronic workflows and document management within Laserfish. At this time, administration would like to add 10 more named users to keep the momentum of the projects moving forward. The agenda collect collaboration process has been completed and the incident injury workflow in the township library archiving system are in progress. Uh, more users are needed to, uh, to, so documents uh, can be assessed as they are archived. Uh, 10 additional named users is a uh, cost of 6,500. Uh, Laserfish Software Assurance Program, uh, this is through October 24th of 2024, is uh, $5,965.75, and then a professional training uh, is $600. Um, uh, CIP was created in 2019 to, pre to begin the document management process, and last year $33,000 was carried <coughs> over into the 2020 budget. Item number two is a uh, uh, requisition item to GPS Vehicle Tracking Solutions, LLC, in the amount of $12,378. This is a mo uh, requesting a motion to affirm an emergency purchase of 5,000 KN95 masks for personal protection in response to the COVID-10 pandemic, COVID-19. Sorry about that. Uh, the fire and police departments are utilizing masks daily, and due to an overwhelming demand for supplies nationwide, the volume of masks are necessary because we are uncertain when the supplies will be available again. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rebholtz in the police department was able to contact uh, GPS Vehicle Tracking Solutions and uh, doing business as an integrity surveillance group and secure 5,000 KN95 masks. Item number three is a motion to uh, approve a requisition to MP Digital LLC in the amount of $38,443.77 to provide professional services, software, and training for lazy laser fish uh, for online plan submittal software. Uh, in 2018, community development began exploring options for online plan submittal software through various vendors. Community development explored various companies, including uh, personal presentations and online demonstrations from interested companies. After interviewing several companies and receiving proposals, community de development decided to move forward with MP Digital. In our meetings, MP Digital was the overwhelming uh, choice for the community development staff to provide a high level of product uh, that we wanted for the cu customers. Uh, moving forward, uh, online plan submittal serves several goals, all with our customers in mind. The most obvious advantage is uh, significantly reducing reproduction and mailing costs for customers. We currently require five full-size drawings to be submitted, and especially with major projects, the cost of producing five full, full sets of uh, pro uh, blueprints is significant. Uh, hold on, there's more. Uh, with the Westchester Fire Department and community development being in different physical locations, the online submittals will allow each department to coordinate their plan reviews much easier than the current system. As you know, MP Digital was recently contracted by Westchester to provide the work for streamlining, streamlining administration's records. Uh, 
community development does anticipate several efficiency markers by utilizing the same company as administration and this can only benefit Westchester stakeholders. Item number four. Uh, for Stryker Sales Corporation in the amount of 122000 for the purchase of four LifePak 15 cardiac monitors for advanced life support capabilities. This is CIP 1574. In May of 2019, the Westchester Fire Department added a LifePak 15 cardiac monitor and medication bag that carries advanced life-saving medications on two of our fire apparatus. Since the inception of these paramedic fire apparatuses, and citizens have been able to receive the same level of care regardless of if a fire or apparatus or medic unit arrives first. As COVID-19 incident evolves, studies are showing that the respiratory and cardi cardiac systems are suffering the effects of the virus. Cardiac assessments along with the passive monitoring of the respiratory system could benefit both the patient and the crews. And I hate to speak for the chief now, but I, I imagine he wishes he had the, that he's on the apparatus right now. Um, by purchasing these cardiac monitors, all customers of the Westchester Fire Department will have advanced life support capabilities available to them regardless of what piece of equipment arrives first. Item number five. A requisition for Bound Tree Medical LLC in the amount of $47,682.82. This is to purchase the various disposable EMS supply items for the annual bulk order. Um, these various disposable EMS supply items uh, are a part of the yearly bulk supply order. Uh, the order is broken up between two vendors to get the best and lowest price of the uh, on these items. Boundary Medical is this item. Our EMS supplies are ordered based on inventory control and tracking system that shows what was used and how many we have in inventory. It is critical for patient care to have these supplies needed on hand for proper patient care. Um, there's a laundry list of uh, items that are part of this requisition for Boundary Medical. And this is a uh, purchase order S200983. Item number six, requisition item for Teleflex Medical Incorporated in the amount of $8,645 to purchase interosseous needles and drives for EMS supplies for the annual bulk order. This is uh, the second vendor of the, of the purchase. Uh, Teleflex is the sole provider of the EZIO system and associated supplies. An interosseous device allows providers to administer medications directly into the bone rather than the IV site. Last year, the fire department performed 55 injections this, through this method and expects to perform even more this year as they be, have become the standard of care. Uh, there's a variety of sizes of needles and um, drivers to force the needles, sorry, into the bones. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Item number seven, uh, for services, community services. Uh, requisition item to Adletta Incorporated in the amount of $131,791. At the February 11th, 2020 meeting, the Board of Trustees accepted a bid from Adletta Incorporated and approved a PO for $793,888.26 includes road funds and contingency. Uh, these TIF funds, uh, uh, TIF funds of $264,081.40 uh, and 10% uh, contingency. After beginning the work in the TIF areas, they identified more foot footage of the curb needing replacement than was allotted through our contingency. An additional 1,400 li li lineal feet of curb needs to be replaced between two TIF areas. Unit pricing is $38.52 per lineal fit from the bid. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent staffing changes, the community S services department uh, has fallen a bit behind in repairing catch basins ahead of scheduled paving replacement. 
in order to catch up and ensure we can complete the work necessary prior, prior, prior to the paving being replaced, we have identified an opportunity to utilize our contractors to help with the catch basin repair in these areas where the roads need repaved. Uh, the department solicited quotes for the work and the curb contractor Adletta Incorporated is also able to help with the catch basin repairs at this time. The new PO amount will be $925,679.26. Item number eight, uh, requisition item for Jackson Construction Incorporated in the, in the amount of $10,626. Remove asphalt from curb on inner ocean. This is CIP 1258. Some township streets have received a layer of paving over the existing street without milling the old pavement off. In some areas, this also means the pavement extends into and over the concrete curb. We are attempting, as we perform infrastructure improvements each year, to identify ways to correct this uh, unfortunate circumstance. Uh, working with one of the previous curb contractors, Jackson Construction, uh, they have identified a way to remove the pavement from the curb without ruining the curb with a milling machine. We believe this is less damaging to the curb and will decrease additional curb replacement. Inner Ocean has 2,100 feet of curb that is not scheduled to be replaced prior to, to paving TIF funds can be utilized for this work. Jackson can complete the removal on Inner Ocean for approximately $10,000, and there is a 10% contingency fee in the amount of $966. Item number nine, uh, requisition item for MCOR facility services in the amount of $4,341. This is to replace the front doors on Molehauser Barn. This is an increase to purchase order number S2760. Over the winter, a bullet hole was discovered in the glass on one of the front doors at Molehauser Barn. The door has a double set with re is a double set with a removable locking bar for easier access for equipment. Due to the, to the glass damage and age of the double doors, both front doors will need to be replaced. The township insurance will cover uh, most of it or, or Im is reimbursing the for $3,000. Uh, the community service de department has solicited quotes for the work and has selected MCOR facility services to perform the work. Those are all the requisition items for this uh, trustee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Burks. I'll entertain a motion to approve requisition items one through nine. I'll so move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on these uh, items? I, I have a quick question. Yep. Uh, Mr. Burks, on item two, <coughs> the GPS uh, vehicle tracking solutions, 5,000 masks, uh, Integrity Surveillance Group appears to be in Mount Olivet, Kentucky, but there's $528 of shipping and handling. Uh, is, it, is this coming from? Mount Olivet, Kentucky? I think um, that's a good question. I'm not sure where the shipping fees were. Uh, it, there may have been from the manufacturer to Kentucky and then we may have went and got the masks. But I'm not sure, that's a good question. We'll check, we'll definitely check on it. Okay. That's a good, that's a good um, the shipping may have been from the manufacturer to the vendor. But uh, that's my assumption. I'm not saying that's what where it is, but uh, okay. we can they, check. Okay. And is the it, are they drop shipping it from the supplier then? You, uh, if you would check on it, please. Yes, sir. I will. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, that is a good question. I didn't catch that. Um, yeah. It just seems like it's a lot to come from. A lot Kentucky. of shipping. Yeah. 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 It seems. Yeah. You're right. For us to. In fact, I believe we went and picked it up. That's a different order. Oh, okay. Okay. Even if it were was delivered, five hundred and twenty-six dollars from Kentucky seems like quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, Colonel Herzog commented that uh, 
the shipment was delivered to the township. And well, he's going to approach the mic now. I don't have the specifics on this, uh, but I know we did receive delivery on Sunday night. And I don't know if the shipping was, I don't believe it was from Kentucky to here. I believe it was from overseas to the, like Mr. Okay. Burke said, to the, uh, our vendor. And then it was passed on is what uh, my understanding. Okay. But we can get those exact <clears throat> answers. Yeah. Might have been a rush delivery too. It could have, yeah, right. Yeah. It could have been. We'll find out exactly what is part of the shipping cost. Though. Yeah. And, and do we know where these are manufactured? I don't, I don't have that information. Okay. Uh, if we could just. I do know that when we do receive shipments, uh, Chief Prince's uh, team, uh, whether they're uh, the procurement team usually, they inspect and make sure that the mask meet the requirements for, well, the KN95 mask right. meet the requirements uh, of the CDC. Okay. While you're up there, um, Colonel Herzog, I had a quick question. So um, Chief Prince is working on making sure the, the fire trucks have, have life-saving equipment on them so that there's equipment depending on which vehicle shows up. And I know that we had a life-saving measure with one of our patrolmen, was it last week? Yes. It, do you feel like you your cars have enough life-saving equipment on them just in case it's a police officer that shows up at the scene? Yeah, now when you say life-saving, are you referring to the PPEs or yeah. just the equipment? We have like AEDs or yeah, equipment some of our hand. vehicles have the uh, AEDs, not all of them. The ones we do have actually were donated uh, some from Firehouse Subs and I, I don't recall who the other one uh, was that donated them, but some of our vehicles do have those that can respond, but all our officers receive the first aid training and everything from the, and the CPR training and certification from the fire department. Well, if that's so, something you wanna explore a little bit more, I wouldn't have a problem with that, making sure that the cars have what they need, just in case it's a police officer that shows up first. Because <clears throat> I know all the guys have good training, so just, just a thought, when I saw that I was, just made me think about it. I believe, I don't know the exact number, but I believe our inventory is like 10 or 12 AEDs, so I'm not, I'm not sure how they're distributed, which cars, supervisor cars. I know the supervisor cars has them, but I don't know which patrol officer cars also have them. Are the supervisor cars in the street? Yes. Yeah, yeah, there are. Okay. Just curious. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the requisition items? No. no. Okay. Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yes. 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 Uh, we have no personnel items, personnel items this evening, so we'll move on to business items. Uh, item 10, Mr. Burke's administration. Yes. Uh, motion to approve a license agreement between Westchester Township Board of Trustees and Union Center Boulevard Merchants Association for a portion of township property at 9285 Center Point Drive and ancillary and adjacent roadways for the production and presentation of the Union Center Food Truck Rally. The Union Center Boulevard Merchant Association <coughs> is holding its eighth annual uh, food truck rally. This event is planned for Friday, August 14th from 11 a.m. to 10.30 p.m. and features a full day of food trucks and live music from lunchtime through the evening. Westchester Township will sponsor the fireworks to play that display that concludes the, the evening. The event serves and supports UCBMA's mission to market and promote the Union Center area and each year benefits a different charity. This year, the Food Truck Rally's beneficiary is Star Shine Hospice. Very good, I'll entertain a motion to approve item 10. I want to move. I'll second. We have a motion and a second, any discussion? Now, the, did I hear uh, the fireworks? Uh, have we approved that? I believe so, yes. For this year? Yeah. It's usually under $5,000. Right. So. Yeah. I, I maybe uh, slipped my mind. Yeah. I thought it was less. Actually, year normally it comes to the trustees, but since it's below, oh, okay. yeah. you've approved it through the budgeting process. Oh, it was a line item on the budget, and um, I authorized it under my authority. Okay. <clears throat> It's a requisition less than $7,500. That's right. I forgot yeah. that. Thank you. Fingers crossed that it happens this yeah. year. So, any other comments or questions? 
Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mr. Wall? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Mr. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Burks, item 11, administration. Yes. Uh, motion to approve license agreement between Westchester Township Board of Trustees and the Neurosurgery Fitzpatrick Chari Foundation for the use of a portion of the township property at 6830 and 8558 Beckett Road and ancillary and adjacent public roadways for the production and presentation of the LEI 5K run walk and post race LEI bash. Uh, the Neurosurgery Fitz Fitzpatrick Chari, Ch Chiari Foundation is requesting approval to host its LEI 5K run walk and LEI bash at Beckett Park. The event is planned for Friday, June 26th from 7 p.m. until midnight. This is the eighth, eighth year for the event, and the Chiari Research and Education at Cincinnati Children's Hospital are regarding malformations of the brain are, that are found in one in 1,000 babies born. This is a ticketed item, or a ticketed event, and uh, anticipation of 1,000 people or more. Um, the post-race party will take, at, take place at Mulhauser Barn and in the Beckett Park parking lot with food, beer, and a band performance. All event parking will take place at Beckett Park and law enforcement uh, for security and traffic control will be reimbursed by the organization. Wonderful, I'll entertain a motion to approve item 11. I'll so move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second, any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call please. Mr. Welsh? Yes. Mr. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Mr. Burks, item 12, administration. Yes, motion to apply for Ohio Historical Records Advisory Board matching grant not to exceed $5,000 to offset the cost of document management, organizing, and digitization, and to authorize the township administrator to accept said grant if awarded. Uh, due to COVID-19, the Ohio Historical Records Advisory Board has extended its grant application deadline to April 30th. These grants are for archival institutions to help them preserve and or provide access to Ohio's historical records and the grants are between $500 and $5,000. Township administration would like to apply for the project uh, to access arrange, arrangement and description identifying, organizing and improving access to historical records. Uh, funding received will be applied toward digitizing the administration library. Very good. I'll entertain a motion to approve item 12. So move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Uh, Mr. Burks, item 13, administration. Yes, motion to approve and enter into a memorandum of understanding between the Westchester Township Board of Trustees and State of Ohio in, in a coalition of defendants named One Ohio in the state lawsuit for claims made against pharmaceutical companies. The State of Ohio was one of the hardest hit by the opioid ep epidemic. Uh, the State uh, of Ohio has sued five <coughs> pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies in 2017. The Ohio Attorney General claimed these companies fraudulent, fraudulently marketed powerful prescription painkillers as non-addictive medications which are safe in large quantities. The lawsuit further alleges pharmaceutical manufacturers failed to take appropriate measures to track suspicious prescription orders. The Ohio Attorney General has proposed that the state and all of its political subdivisions ba band together as a coalition of defendants in the state lawsuit. The state has given its proposed coalition the name One Ohio. One Ohio would then seek global settlement of all their claims against the pharmaceutical companies. The Attorney General drafted the MOU, outlining <clears throat> terms and conditions with which any local government wishing to participate in this settlement must agree to. Very good, I'll entertain a motion to approve item 13. I should move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second, any discussion? I, I do have uh, uh, some questions. On page two of the uh, MOU, One Ohio Memorandum of Understanding, um, 
under B, allocation of settlement proceeds. All opioid funds shall be divided with 30% going to local governments, 55% to the foundation, which is structured and described below, and 15% to the office of the Ohio Attorney General's Council. Um, can you, when I look at this, it looks like in any settlement, uh, the, the share that might go to the affected geographies or jurisdictions would be 30%. Is that correct or is that? I believe so. And then it's uh, prorated by, uh, I think, population. There's a uh, calculation that's made at, at, at the appendix of this. If okay. you take a look for Westchester Township, the, uh, on the very last page, 0.3737%? Yes. Of the, of the allocation. How much it is. Of oh, the percent yeah. So is the, is the um, council in litigation expenses, is that, is, is, is that paid by the, uh, the foundation 55%, do you know? No, I think 55% would go to the foundation, which is the entity of One Ohio, which is basically the state. And then... Actually, I didn't look at that. What is One Ohio? I didn't actually look. <clears throat> well, One Ohio is, is the name of the program right. that mm -hmm. you know, they put together. But um, I guess my, 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 my question is, is that when it talks about council and litigation, and that's the foundation, is 55% going to lawyers to uh, argue this case, is, is my question. Um, payment of counsel and litigation expenses is section C on page three. Correct. And this is the local government fee fund uh, to compensate counsel for the local governments if the parties cannot secure a separate payment of fees and associated litigation expense. Uh, the first 45% of the LGFF amount shall be drawn from the, and, and then the remaining 55% shall be drawn from the foundation share. So that looks like um, no portion of the local government uh, found, uh, local government fee fund amount may be assessed against or drawn from the state's share. So yes, um, it it would be hard to line item list from this. It says yeah. 11 11 percent of it, the money accounts for attorneys' fees, 30 percent for local governments, and 55 percent right. to a new nonprofit foundation. Right. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I just I just want to make sure that this this money goes to the places where it needs to go, and it doesn't end up in the lawyers' pockets. Right. Uh, some attorneys will get paid, though, and, but it'll and, be and part and of the settlement, should. hopefully. Yeah. Right, they should get paid. Yeah. But the lion's share should go to the jurisdictions yeah. that are part of this one Ohio yeah. and that are looking for compensation from these pharmaceutical companies who have done the, the damage, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I think the state does a lot of programs through Medicaid, so that's probably where a lot of the programs will come through and from. And do we know do we know a part of this LGFF, this local government foundation, is going to go to Medicaid? Probably yeah, not, I don't know. Probably I don't not just, the local portion, the state portion yeah. probably will. Okay. And not to Medicaid, but and supporting. And that state portion would be fifty-five percent. That's what it says. A new nonprofit yeah. foundation. Yeah. But it probably wouldn't go to Medicaid. Yeah. But I'm saying like programs that are supported within Medicaid would be bolstered. Or My concern is that a settlement may change all of this. Yeah. Uh, as part of the settlement, some of this may have to change. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. You know, uh, right now, this is the plan. And it's the MOU, and they mm -hmm. want to stick to it. But I'm afraid uh, once a settlement is made, there may be some changes depending on the amount. That's true. Yeah. Well, a settlement could be yeah. two years Anything. off. I mean, yeah. it could, yeah. be a long, could. could be a long yeah. settlement. Okay, just just some you know some yeah those are those are all very good questions. questions. I, I apologize, I didn't. Die. I read through this, yeah. and Frost Brown Todd has reviewed it as well, um, but I don't know it. Uh, I don't have an expert knowledge of it by any means. Uh, I do know the basics of it and know the contents of it, but 
how it's all divided apart is a good question. And, uh, okay. Uh, all right. Well, we'll continue to study and look into. Yeah. That. Yeah. And uh, I think the point is, uh, I know the number that was used as uh, for an example was that on a hundred million dollar settlement, we would receive three hundred and some odd thousand. I think it was. Uh, and, but your question is, where is everything else going uh, other than to the township or uh, other communities? And, and I believe you're right. Uh, the 55% goes to the, the One Ohio. The foundation. Uh, yeah, foundation, uh, the fund to help with opioid, uh, well, you know, treatment. And well, it's my personal opinion that it, that as much money should go into the local jurisdictions because they're going to do what's best with the money. Right. If you start having somebody else telling you, okay, well, we need to do this, we need to do that, and you know, then it may not be suitable for your community to to address the needs that you have. Yeah. And but, we have to, and we have to too think about what we would do with that money. That's a big. Oh, it's I mean, it's outlined what we can do with that money. Right. Yeah. But we don't yeah. have. We, yeah. But we but but it's better in our hands than it is, for instance, in the county's hands or or in the state's oh, yeah. because. You know, we're intimately we're knowledgeable about Westchester. We, we don't do drug affected. treatment and drugs. Yeah, but it's, it's, there's a lot of education that yeah, goes we do, on we and that do. type of thing. Please and it may be that there, there's some equipment that we can use that we can buy with this as well. You know, outlined in the program. So, well, when you, all the local governments, it means counties, townships, cities, and villages. So the counties have a role in this as well. They'll have a take as well. Right. So, uh, but yeah, uh, a lot of the money will be going into. Well, 30% of it, I believe, is, goes into local government. I don't see the uh, city government in, in this, uh, yeah, on it, this it, list. It uses the definition of local governments as counties, townships, cities, villages within a geographic boundaries, boundaries in the state of Ohio. So which is, this page just a, a part of it? That is just one oh, part one of it. Part. We felt, figured, you know. I'm, That's all we need yeah, to know. Yeah, we I just wanted you. to show the Westchester's portion I of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot of details that um, would need to be worked out once a settlement is in place. Uh, and I can, I can work with, uh, I believe it was uh, Austin, uh, that re review, Austin from Frostbound Todd, Musser, Austin Musser was, reviewed it and uh, uh, he gave me a, a overview of it, but he didn't really go into too much detail. Mm -hmm. He focused on the township's role on it. Okay. And we can uh, identify where all the other revenue, if there is any, on the, from the settlement will be going. Okay. Break it down even more. Lot to think about. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, and again, and you bring up a very good point that how do we want to use this if we we receive it? Um, but we have time to determine that between now and a settlement. Right. Um, but it outlines several areas where we must use it. Uh, use the money and that's in education and uh, covering some of the costs historically and um, prevention so and we can we have we do a lot of that already yeah we do is there a timetable on this how long when uh, it will be heard Don's guess would be better than mine um, I think we have to approve it tonight. no oh no true no the, no yeah I'm the sign up for participation is uh, indefinite. Uh, they extended it. But on the actual case yeah, and settlement, a, I, I don't know how long this would take. A ruling on the settlement? Oh, yeah. If it please the board, I, I did take a look at this myself and you really don't have much leverage to change anything. It's either you participate or you don't. If you don't, then you have to file your own lawsuit, which would involve several hundred thousand dollars in legal fees, and I don't think we want to go in that direction. So we're pretty much having to trust the state that has, of course, the largest stake in this because they're writing most of the checks. Um, and so far, I think, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's it's fair enough it isn't the way i would write it or that you would want it uh, but it's certainly better than zero mm -hmm. and uh, at the end of the day um, 
it could be changed. You're correct about that, but it's uh, it would have to be with the agreement of the a majority of the participants. So uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you Don. Thanks, Don. Thanks. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll add some more information from Austin Musser uh, in my administrator's report uh, okay. on Friday. Okay. Thanks, Larry. Any yeah. other questions or comments about the MOU for the One Ohio settlement? Nope. No. I'll entertain a motion to approve item 13. I'll so move. I'll second. I have a motion. Well, I guess we already did this, we didn't we? Did Sorry. It was a long discussion. Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yeah, Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Burks, uh, item 14, administration. Yes. Uh, motion to extend emergency status and reauthorize township administrator to respond to coronavirus circumstances through May 12, 2020 at 11.59 p.m. Uh, on March 9th, uh, Governor, uh, Governor Mike DeWine signed an executive, executive order 2020-01D declaring a state of emergency. Uh, on March 11th, uh, well, you know the history. Uh, the World Health Organization de declared a pandemic for the coronavirus. Um, this action will uh, extend the previous action uh, made in an emergency uh, to enable Westchester administrative team to uh, take immediate action uh, and uh, delegates me, continues to delegate the township administrator to for purchases up to $30,000 uh, related to the uh, coronavirus uh, r response. Uh, any purchase made will be authorized at the next uh, trustee meeting. So, and uh, I typically do a pretty good job, I think, of reaching out to you whenever I do make a purchase. If, if we need to secure something, I will continue to do that as well. This extended emergency status and reauthorization of the township administrator to respond to coronavirus circumstances will end at 11.59 on May 12, 2020, unless we need to, hopefully we don't, but unless we need to extend it again. Very good. I'll entertain a motion to approve item 14. I'll so move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Burks, item 15, community development. Yes. Motion to approve a temporary waiver of the Westchester Township zoning application fees for specified residential permits through June 26, 2020. Uh, Westchester trustees and administration have tasked each department to consider steps to help our community during this time of uncertainty. Community development is recommending a temporary waiving of fees related to simple residential improvement projects and home occupation businesses. Uh, each of them, uh, currently the fees are $25 to $35. Um, the, the proposed uh, waived residential permits are accessory structures, fences, decks, pools, additions or alt alterations and home occupations. Now first I need to emphasize this is not waiving the permit. People interested in doing a project uh, still needs to, they need to fill out a permit. We're just waiving the fee uh, for the permit structure until um, June 26th uh, for, or yeah, 26th, 2020. Very good. I'll entertain a motion to approve item 15. I uh, second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I broke the latch on my fence and went to Lowe's the other day and I found everybody in Westchester. There were a lot of people <laughs> doing projects. So if you have something you're working on, uh, take this opportunity and get a couple couple dollars off your, off your project. I want to compliment the Community Development Department for proposing this because uh, the revenue that we'll lose on it is really minuscule compared to the bigger picture. The idea is to uh, help people with their projects since they're at home, if they're at home for uh, quarantine or, or whatever, if they have a project that they've been planning, now would be a good time to do it. We want to help them out with that. So uh, it's, it's a good, good thing. It, it's at a minimum a, a good gesture, I think. And uh, um, we're glad to do it because I know a lot of people are at home thinking of what, what can we do? 
Anything else? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mr. Burks, item 16, fire. Uh, yes, motion to advertise for bids for 2020 turnout gear replacement. Uh, in an effort to reduce carcinogen exposure, the current collective bargaining agreement uh, requires that all collective bargaining members receive two sets of turnout gear in the fire department. The fire department has budgeted 95,000 for turnout gear replacement in 2020 through CIP number 1338. The fire department requests permission from the board of trustees to advertise for bids for the 2020 turnout gear replacement. I'll entertain a motion to approve item 16. I so move. second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Is, is that for all department? The I don't, it's only a few, I believe. Only a few. Fifty sets of turnout okay. gear. Okay. Very good. Any other questions? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Burks, item 17, police. Yes, motion to approve and enter into a memorandum of understanding between the Westchester Township Board of Trustees and the City of Monroe to form a Regional Police Crisis Response Unit. The t Police Department is requesting the trustees approval to enter in a MOU between the City of Monroe and Westchester Township on behalf of the Pol Westchester Police Department to establish and maintain a Regional Crisis Response Unit, uh, or otherwise a SWAT team, correct? Uh, this regional CRU will be responsible for tactical responses within the political subdivisions of both agencies for situations requiring resources, personnel, and equipment above and beyond daily police requirements and capabilities. Very good. I'll entertain a motion to approve item 17. I so move. Uh, I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Do you, um, did I, I do have a question. No. This kind of MOU, in case there is a, a, a liability, a lawsuit? Who? I believe each department represent, has their own liability insurance when, uh, even if in another community, correct? Is that right? Okay. Right. You wanna fill us in a little bit on this yeah. MOU with yes. Monroe? He looked eager. <laughs> yeah. I assume there would, might be some questions with yeah. this. I know uh, Colonel Herzog is very mm -hmm. proud of this relationship. I, I, mm -hmm. we, he and I have talked about it quite a bit. Yes, um, we've been working with Monroe. Uh, we've been covering their area for the last two and a half years uh, as far as SWAT coverage uh, while they were trying to revamp their team. And they decided it was more beneficial as we spoke and it's beneficial, fiscally responsible for everybody to join. And then it saves us money. We have less personnel on the team. They're gonna pay some fees uh, for that team and then we can work together. And then we, the coverage uh, will cover both Westchester and Monroe. There's also a push um, to look at other regionalizations around the county for us to work together. And this is kind of that first step. Now that we'll be together, then we're able to uh, integrate with other, agents, other agencies to eventually hopefully get to a, a county-wide team. Um, that can cover the entire county and what that does is it combines resources um, and then in, uh, in manpower every person is able to, or every agency is able to have less officers on the team less overtime for each agency and it's it's uh, spreading the burden out amongst everybody how, how often does this, the SWAT team get called it, it depends uh, it's on average, I would say what we use the SWAT team for um, is about 10 times a year. It's been as, as few as four or five. Uh, so what we're trying to do is not use the SWAT team or the crisis response team. In the past, you saw them used uh, for certain um, barricaded subjects, uh, nonviolent, or we don't use the SWAT team for that. If we're able to form a, a three-man entry team, we can do that with the personnel working if they're if they're crisis response trained and so it, it's brought our numbers down we don't do um, these no not are these no knock search warrants where you see us kicking in doors uh, that kind of thing that you see on television and that that's that's not utilized we're more of a call out uh, and wait basically it's, it reduces the safety um, risk for both the the subject inside and the officers so it can be as high as 10 I think we've had uh, Two, two call outs last year to Monroe. We've already had one there this year. Uh, and then plus our call outs also. 
So the SWAT team is called out that by then the de-escalation is over. That we, we still have, when the SWAT team is crisis response team, SWAT, mm. whatever you want to call it, uh, mm. when they are called out, we automatically, our crisis negotiators go out also. So there's still, that's our first contact, Dude. and the whole time is trying to get a peaceful resolution right. to get them to come out. So it can go, the hours of the SWAT standoff is usually SWAT teams ready to go. It's the crisis negotiators that are working the deal to get them out. Mm -hmm. As in, in Liberty Township, when we had the uh, juvenile held hostage mm -hmm. uh, by a non-family member, it was the SWAT team was ready to go right away. Butler County SWAT team was ready to go, but it was negotiators that worked for those 20 plus hours to get the, the situation yeah, resolved. resolved. Yeah. Mm, very good. What I like about it is the multi-jurisdictional cooperation and the exchange of information. Every department has a little bit different information or resources and, and techniques that they share. And we have uh, the, you know, the best of all worlds, if you will. And I don't know how many uh, communities we partner with now for, uh, is there four? Four communities that four. are? The, no, this team will just be us and Monroe. Uh, but, However, we work side by side with Hamilton PD and their SWAT team is Hamilton, um, I believe Ox, well, it's Hamilton and Fairfield I know for sure is part of their SWAT team. So if, if our SWAT team is down or out for some training, they cover us or we cover them. If they're training, their team goes out. So we, we train together a couple times a year to make sure we have the same tactics and everything. Yeah. So it's, it's very beneficial and especially with, with Monroe, with Chief Buchanan up there, his his professionalism that he's bringing to the department and what he's gonna be able to bring to the SWAT team is gonna to add to us, like yeah. Mr. Burke said. It's what, what we have is really gonna help us out here. Yeah, wonderful. And if it's anything like the fire department and the MOUs with the fire department, they have been really uh, beneficial to the township, for sure. Very good. Wonderful. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm good. No. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for the clarification. I, while I'm up here, before you vote on this, uh, the masks, the masks were made in Asia, and that's where part of the shipping came from, is that we bared, oh. bared some of the costs coming from uh, Asia to be to our vendor here in Kentucky. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's Thanks. quick work. Thank you. Good yeah. That's good. Good one. <laughs> good investigation skills. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yeah. Mr. Welch? Yes. And Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Burks, item 18, please. Uh, yes, a motion not to object to a new C1 and C2 liquor permit for Mariana's International Deli Incorporated doing business as La Comica Deli at 7743 Tylersville Road, Unit C. I hope I got the name right. Me too. Uh, I'll entertain a motion not to object to item 18. I'll, I'll motion not to object. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welsh? Yes. Uh, we have an emergency resolution tonight. Uh, Mr. Burke's emergency resolution 08-2020. Yes. Motion to approve emergency resolution number 08-2020, authorizing the township administrator to modify or suspend provisions of the collective bargaining agreements, department rules and regulations, and township personnel policies in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. On March 9, 2020, Governor Mike DeWine declared a state of emergency in Ohio. And soon after, uh, Health Director Dr. Amy Acton instituted social distancing orders. Uh, and the township promptly implemented several operational changes to comply with these orders to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Um, the township as, a, as an organization and community rely on our bargaining members every day to keep them safe and provide essential services. Administration has always strived to, has always strived to honor agreements approved by the trustees and the bargaining units with the understanding that serving our community in the, in the greatest capacity is our ultimate responsibility. Administration's number one concern is keeping everyone safe, employees and community members alike. Um, uh, administration, uh, administration will strive to continue operations as normally as possible for as long as possible, but will need to act quickly 
to adequately respond to this emergency. If adjustments are needed that are contrary to provisions in the CBAs, administration will first try to reach an agreement with the bargaining units. However, if an impasse is reached and it is impossible to continue service in, to our community in the time of crisis without making a change, administration will move forward with the change. Essentially, this allows us the flexibility uh, to work with the unions, uh, to work beyond the collective bargaining agreements to respond to any emergency uh, related to res COVID-19 response. So uh, regardless of where the great ideas come from, whether they come from the, the unions or whether they come from administration or somewhere within uh, and the community, uh, this will allow us, if we uh, mutually agree upon it, to go ahead and take those actions to re, uh, to improve our, our response to the emergency and crisis. Very good. Any questions or clarifications about resolution 08-2020? No. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to second citizen's <coughs> comments. Um, I know we had one submission from the email. Oh, we have a resident. Yes. Would you like to address the board? Will you please um, give us your name and address for the record, please? Can you uh, go Step forward, right over here. Thanks. Um, my name is Michael DeSalvo, and I live at 8371 Birchstone Court. So um, I come here to the board, uh, the board about Dead birds, dead bees, and dead babies. As someone with a painful autoimmune condition of 25 years, many thought I would be for Obamacare, but because of its funding of the murdering of unborn children through taxpayer money, I not only helped pass Ohio's Health Care Freedom Amendment Act, but made international news by picketing Steve Driehaus at his home to let him know it was not okay to reject the voters' will and help kill innocent children. Today I speak of a new hidden threat not coronavirus, but something many experts believed helped fuel this outbreak of the disease that has ended thousands of lives and has done grave financial and emotional damage to millions of Americans. I speak of the 4G and 5G small cells that have been allowed by three members of the Board of Trustees, literally poisoning my friends and possibly causing autism in my child, George. In China's rollout, over 10,000 of these new antennas were installed in Wuhan before Christmas when the world saw the rise of the coronavirus. To those who have studied it, the effects of this very powerful microwave radiation are well researched. Eye problems, lower bacterial resistance, psychological problems, and cancer. I have seen this cancer diagnosed even in my students, and it's not okay. With these towers planned to now be only 300 yards apart on average, we are killing our citizens because unelected officials have not stood up for home rule. Documented evidence has shown the massive death of birds and bees near these towers, as well as stillbirths of unborn babies, since 5G impairs mitochondrial function on the level of DNA. To guard the economic interests of Westchester and the health of its citizens, I ask for a moratorium on this dangerous technology, as Verizon and other telecom companies are taking advantage of the quarantine to spread more damaging microwave radiation. It is unlawful to experiment on human subjects without consent and I do not believe it is right to prostitute the rights for the perverse interests of powerful companies. We cannot afford to have our immune systems and economy further crippled. So I ask Lee Wong and Mark Welsh to reverse the zoning allowances they made in the first place and initiate a moratorium to stop this threat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are there any other um, questions for the board tonight? Huh? Sorry, Bruce. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, yes, we had one um, comment for this evening. The, there's a quest, two questions from Jeremiah York, 9515 Woodland Hills Drive, Westchester, 45011. And he had two questions for Mr. Wong. Um, would you please explain why you recused yourself to purchase masks at the last meeting? And would you please produce a copy of the check the Chinese Chamber of Commerce paid for the masks purchased from China that were later sold to Westchester? 
Um, first, thank you, Mr. York, um, for your question for inclusion in tonight's meeting. Um, and in response to the questions, um, the first question, Mr. Wong um, did recuse himself from the vote on the mask because he is a member of the board of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Um, and he wanted to avoid any perception that his vote would have had a conflict of interest. Um, and for the second question, um, as a Westchester Township trustee, Mr. Wong is not able to produce a check that was written by the Midwest Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Um, we don't have access to another or organization's financial records. So. And that is the only comment that we had for this evening. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you I think we're, we'll definitely have one more meeting like this. So if there are any more questions mm -hmm. for the next <laughs> board meeting, um, send them in. Um, let's see. So now we will move on to uh, voting on the emergency <coughs> resolution 08-2020. So I'll entertain a motion to declare resolution 08-2020 an emergency and dispense with the second reading. Can I have a motion? I should move. A uh, second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, just, just real quick to add to what uh, Mr. Burke said. Uh, this resolution doesn't make any changes to the agreements that we have with our collective bargaining units. It simply allows our administrator to uh, work more quickly with union members to come up with creative solutions when needed. So. That's very true. We need flexibility uh, at this time. Yeah. And we this. appreciate the collective bargaining uh, units for all of our employees for having that level of flexibility during this unprecedented right. time mm -hmm. in our township and our country. Yeah, I appreciate that. They get it. Um, and they want to they be as helpful as they can be. Right. So. Very good. Mr. Wong, did you have anything? Uh, I think in uh, you can answer the the uh, uh, is this a trustee comment? Um, no. No, no, oh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. We're actually voting to declare it's not that. an emergency, so we'll have to vote one more time. But oh, if I forgot. You want to you want to save it? No, I don't have anything to say. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Jones. Roll call, please. Yeah, Mr. Welch. Yes. Mrs. Becker. Yes. And Mr. Wong. Yes. So I'll entertain a motion now to approve Resolution 08-2020. I should move. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Further discussion? <laughs> Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mr. Wong? Yes. And Mr. Welch? Yes. And Mrs. Becker? Yes. And now we come to our any discussion items or any elected official comments. Larry, did you have anything you uh, want yeah, to Yeah, you know, uh, just so the uh, elected officials are aware that um, small cell tower, the 4G, 5G, that's all governed and uh, by the state and the federal government. So. <clears throat> Um, in fact, that's what that text message was. That was from Aaron Wiegand. He, he was telling me that the zoning, uh, the state regulates that. And so does the federal government, the FCC regulates that as well. Uh, as a township, we, I'm not even sure if we have the legal authority to put a moratorium on that. But unless I hear from the legal, uh, uh, from one of the trustees or the legal law director, Don Crane, uh, I'm not planning on any research regarding the moratorium. Well, to add to that, Larry, uh, the reason for that is because um, mobile cells are considered a utility. And local jurisdictions, and Mr. Crane can certainly I, I clarify this, do not have any say-so where utilities are, are, are put. Um, it may be that Mr. York, when he was saying that uh, uh, or maybe it was Michael no, said that, Michael. Mm -hmm. that uh, when they when they asked ab about re reversing this moratorium thing that we had, we attempted. Remember that, Lee? Right. We had, mm -hmm. we we attempted we don't to, have to, to look authority. into this, and we uh, I think that those permits were actually pulled by the county, and we were asking the county, hey, you know, is there anything you can do about that? And and really, the only thing that we were permitted to do at that point, and it, all we could do was ask. It's like, hey. We don't have any um, um, unburied utilities in Union Center Boulevard area. So we don't want this tower on Mulhauser Road. And so all they did was move it, you know, uh, behind uh, Bob Evans there to get it out away from the, uh, you know, uh, the, the general traffic flow. So uh, uh, that's all we could do. And uh, they, they got what they wanted, they put it where they wanted, and, and uh, the local jurisdiction had no authority to tell them that they couldn't. Yeah. I've also referred that gentleman to uh, Warren Davison's office. 
So I spoke with him on the phone. I know Aaron's uh, busy with a lot of things right now, but if, if he could do me a favor and see, let me know how many of these towers we have in the township and okay. what, our, what our authority is for governance over the zoning for these um, 5G towers. I, w I wouldn't mind just having that knowledge of what's in our township and what is within our guidelines. If it is the county's purview, I'm, I, I don't know what power we have over the county, but I'm sure we could throw a fit, but I don't know if that's legal. You can see. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an honest question. Um, anything else? Um, no. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Your, beard lo your beard looks good. Well, Yours too, I could go into it a long diatribe about that. I already <laughs> talked to uh, no, Trustee fine. Welch about it. <laughs> uh, my hair is getting long as well. So. I hear that from a lot of people. You guys are bookends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's rocking. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, in the middle. Bruce, did you have anything? Yes, um, I don't believe we noted earlier for the benefit of the viewing audience that we are practicing social distancing. We're keeping six feet plus apart. And uh, I bring that up at this point to account for why it is that I'm jumping up and down. It's uh, people are called forward to, uh, uh, to the lectern to comment about a subject, uh, whatever it might be, whether it's uh, Chief Prince, uh, Chief Herzog, or Law Director Crane. And uh, they come into my space, which means it becomes their space. So it is, I've got to move and maintain that six feet plus away no, from You just them. don't want your head mm. in the screen. Is that what it's, that is? That's what that is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, so that's why I'm jumping up and down. Perhaps we'll be needing to do it again yet in mm. another two weeks, I suspect. So uh, hopefully that'll be the end of it. But otherwise, I was going to comment, I can't wait for that time to come when our, our businesses will be freed up yeah. to do what they do, mm -hmm. to engage in business. And um, as uncomfortable as it might be for us to um, be staying at home as much as we do, it's most uncomfortable to me that these businesses are not able to engage in commerce and uh, <clears throat> pay their bills, to pay their employees. And that's as uh, discomforting as anything I'm experiencing. Otherwise, um, the only thought I had was um, with the, the, the stimulus, stimulus packages, I'm scared to death of the death this is creating. I, it really gives me renewed appreciation for um, legislators who can say no. I think that's part of the reason we have a problem with the debt before now. So anyway, that's it. That's a lot of wisdom there, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, Mark, did you have anything? Yes. Um, a local business uh, person who has a facility also in Mission, Michigan asked me to read this letter this evening, and it might spark additional conversation. Uh, it, was, it was sent to our state representative. I am reaching out to you as my state representative to express my deep concern about the continued closure of so-called non-essential businesses in Ohio. As an owner of a company that is classified as essential, I rely on businesses that are both classified as essential and non-essential to support my own essential business. It has become clear to me that despite the nature of COVID-19 and its seriousness, our response to it has, in my opinion, been disproportional when compared to other diseases such as the seasonal flu. Add to that, we now know that the medical experts have been counting anyone who died with COVID-19 as having died from COVID-19, and thus vastly skewing actual mortality statistics. This is a failure of our medical experts and our governor for not demanding more scrutiny on the mortality count and statistics showing impact on a per capita basis so decisions can be made with empirical statistical analysis. But because this has not been done, our township, county, and state economy have been gravely harmed because of inaccurate impact models and the inaccurate mortality counts and by turning over our governance to the medical experts who have little understanding of economics and the gravity of their decisions on our economy. Thousands of small businesses simply will not survive this assault and our citizens are hopping mad. Liberties were taken from us in a blink of an eye and without a vote, destroying lives and livelihoods. It will now take years for some companies to recover from the damage done by the wholesale shutdown of our state and country. 
These actions do not bode well for the confidence in our medical experts and elected officials. As a citizen and businessman of this state, I am furious of the apparent poor judgment used leading up to and continuing in the handling of the response to this virus. I am demanding that Governor DeWine reopen the state immediately, and if he wants to condition it with the use of personal protection equipment and sanitation guidelines, then so be it. But open up this state and put our citizens back to work. There is no way of justifying the continued closure of small businesses across this state and, and country when supermarkets, liquor stores, hardware stores, and other businesses that draw people are allowed to be open selling non-essential items under the umbrella of essential business. For every closed business day that passes, businesses will die reducing jobs, income, tax dollars, and our state's ability to fund the many things, including infrastructure, that we need to, that we need to have done. If we open up tomorrow, we give every small business that would have gone out of business the next day a fighting chance to resuscitate their businesses and at least have a chance at reducing the impact of closure of commerce will have. Kindly pass my regards and, and demands along to Governor DeWine. This lunacy must come to an end. So um, this is an individual who has an essential business and uh, obviously is supplied with non-essential and also uh, essential uh, vendors and merchants themselves. And um, the actually we had an update from the federal government today. The IRS has announced it is building a tool to track stimulus payments that should be available later this week. That's positive. In a new working paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research, a team of business researchers surveyed 5,800 small businesses nationwide to determine what effect small businesses are feeling. Their initial findings include 43% of the businesses they surveyed are closed. Employee counts are down by an average of 40% compared to January. The average business has more than $10,000 in monthly expenses and less than one month of cash revenues. So the, uh, I do believe that the situation is dire for small businesses. You know, Westchester Township has the, the greatest number of businesses of any jurisdiction uh, uh, in Ohio. We have, uh, you know, the townships. We have 3,600 small businesses. And based upon what the federal government just released today, probably 43% of those are closed. You know, I've gone around Westchester at lunchtime uh, multiple times. It's a ghost town. I mean, there are no cars. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that people, uh, even though you can go through a drive-through and you're maintaining your social distancing because you're in your car, you don't know what the standard operating procedures are being followed by those inside the restaurant. There could be somebody that has the coronavirus in there and coughs or sneezes on your food, and you walk away from this thing going, well, I, I did all my social distancing, and you know, there was, I didn't, uh, you know. So, you know, there's a, there, there really is a, a, a lot to be, to be said about this. Um, I, I, I am an individualist. I believe in, in, in you, our, your individual rights and to make uh, sweeping declarations for closing businesses. I believe that individuals are smart enough. If you are of higher risk, then you will certainly be battening down the hatches. So this is, this is updated actually from, uh, uh, it was updated today. This is a pie chart that shows deaths in Ohio by age. Age 80 plus, 48%. 48% of the coronaviruses in Ohio are folks over 80 years old. 27% are those 70 to 79. 
16% or 60 to 69, and 8% or 50 to 59, and less than 1% are between the ages of 30 and 49. So nearly half of all deaths are people over, eight, uh, over age 80. So, you know, to me, it's important that we, that we are mindful of our own individual uh, rights here. One of the things that I have felt like, we've all driven on state roads, you know, back in the country and rural this and that, and almost without exception at some point, the farmer drive, you know, starts driving on that road with his tractor and he's going at 20 miles an hour and you have a long line of traffic behind him. I feel like we're, this is what's happened to our economy. We are, we're, 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 we've been shut down and we're, we're all going at a very slow speed here and I think the recovery is gonna be very difficult. I don't think that there is a vacuum that's being created for the services and products that small businesses provide. When in particularly, and I know there's been some pushback on this, uh, you know, the big box stores, they got the essential business thing where they could be essential businesses. So everything within the four walls and under that roof is considered, I guess, essential, but how are essential are toys and jewelry and uh, lawn furniture and mulch and things like this. And, and in, in a lot of cases, there are small businesses out there that would be selling that same exact product, but they're not permitted to because they are not considered a non-essential, excuse me, an essential business. Here is a, here's a very short list of essential versus non-essential businesses, just so we all know. <clears throat> okay, so these are, the, these are the businesses largely agreed to be non-essential. Theaters, gyms and recreation centers, museums, casinos and racetracks, shopping malls, bowling alleys, sporting and concert events, restaurants and bars, salon and spas, and like types. Um, you know, shopping malls. A lot of those goods are sold in these big box shops. Mm. Don't know why you would shut a shop. Because to me, the big boxes have been learning, right? If you go to Kroger, you see that they've got the shields up there that would protect them, right? The six foot. Unfortunately, if somebody sneezes and don't cover their mouth, it can go eight meters. And there's uh, bioaerosols that, are, that, that come out of your mouth when you sneeze that remain suspended in the air for hours. So, you know, I, um, I, would, I would like to see things start to open up and leave it to the individuals to start practicing good standard operating procedures. I think that all these things can be overcome because the, the financial impact to all these businesses being closed is, you know, uh, on March the 15th, when uh, Governor DeWine decided to close down the restaurants and bars, there were zero deaths for coronavirus and only 37 cases. And on that day, the uh, uh, Amy Acton, De Department of Health Director, said, actually, excuse me, on the 18th, she said this, there's no scenario now by which we won't have a surge. And I think we're all, I think we're all, um, we're, we, we're I think that we're, we're all hypersensitive to this and we're all at heightened in our anxiety over this. And, and it's, I think it's partly because of media and because of, of the, the, the predictive models that were early on that predicted millions of deaths. But I will share with you that um, we've compared this to the, to the annual flu, right? <clears throat> I went back and did some research on flu deaths. In the 2018, 19, 2018 and 19 flu season, the CDC estimated that up to 42.9 million people got sick. 647,000 people were hospitalized 
and 61,200 people died. And then they go on to say this, that's fairly on par with a typical season and well below the CDs, CDC's 2017 and 18 estimates of 48.8 million illnesses, 959,000 hospitalizations, and 79,400 deaths. That's how many flu deaths there were in the 2017 and 18 flu season. And if we go all the way back to 2009 and 10, to the swine flu, H1N1, it was considered a pandemic. From 12 April 2009 to 10 April 2010, we estimate that approximately 60.8 million cases, 274,304 hospitalizations, and 12,469 deaths, uh, deaths from H1N1. Unlike this COVID-19, which, which uh, by and large affects older Americans, H1N1 affected younger Americans. <clears throat> but listen to this article real quick. By the World Health Organization's official tally, the flu pandemic of 2009 and 10 killed 18,449 people around the world. Those are deaths of people who had laboratory confirmed cases of the so-called swine flu, H1N1. But a fresh analysis says the real toll was 10 times higher, up to 203,000 deaths. And maybe it was twice that if you count people who died of things like heart attacks precipitated by the flu. Let's take the conservative figure of 203,000 deaths. That's about the same as a normal flu season. So the figure confirms the popular impression that the H1N1 flu pandemic of 2009 was a paper tiger, as these things go. Or as one NPR reporter suggested back in early 2010, the headline might read, despite puffed up fears, swine flu was a complete and total bust. And today, the H1N1 virus that caused that pandemic is now a regular human flu virus and continues to circulate seasonally worldwide. It's probably in the shot you got if you got a flu shot this year. So in the April 3rd, Cincinnati Business Courier, this was like 10 days ago, right? 11 days ago. Our restaurants, a major fallout. The tables have turned, okay? You know what, I'm getting in the weeds here. There's about a, there's, there's about a half a million uh, people in the restaurant business who are out of business. There are about 7.1 million working people in the age group from 18 to 64 in Ohio. A few weeks ago, our unemployment was between 30 and 33 percent, and I have no doubt that it's gone higher. <clears throat> and I think it's probably going to get worse. And when these, and when they started closing down businesses, Job and Family uh, Services was completely unprepared for that. I have 14 people that I, that I employ at, at, at my small business, and only a third of them have received a payment from mm -hmm. unemployment at this point. So. Uh, despite what they might say that things are going smoothly, they were totally unprepared for shutting down businesses and they were com uh, job and family services was completely swamped. They don't even have enough people to process the unemployment. Try going on their website. I've tried mm -hmm. to help some of my employees on the website and it is, it's nothing like Westchester Sorry. Township website. It's intuitive, you know, you, it's easy to navigate and all this. Right. Very difficult, very difficult. Right. <clears throat> You know, so anyway, if uh, if you guys have any comments about that, uh, mm. please share. But uh, mm. you know, I I would love to see this. I think the very mention of a word pandemic strikes fear in the people's hearts. Yeah. And as long as we continue to use it, 
there is going to be heightened fear mm. because of this. At the very beginning, the CDC said the best thing you can do, wash your hands, 20 seconds. Don't touch your face. Don't touch mm. your face. And, and the, the earlier model of Ohio, Governor DeWine office was saying that it was over 200,000. Yeah. He said, we are not even close to that. We're not even close. We have like 7,000 7, confirmed 7, cases. Yeah. And 300 yeah. deaths. But just yeah. like how we make decisions, we have to make it based on the knowledge and facts that we have on hand. So they were making those decisions based on the models and information they it had was. in the moment. And it's difficult. We as leaders understand that in particular. You make your decisions based on what you know. Well, I would like but to see. It was way off. Yeah, I can't, way I'm not, off. man, I'm not defending the, the quality yeah. of the information, but you have to make that decision. And, and to the right of the individual, I understand that. But when it came to the idea of having to choose who gets a respirator and who doesn't, which was the decision that we may have had You're to talking make. Talking a ventilator? Yeah, the, mm, the ventilators. Well, yeah, but the, 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 they're, they're coming out and saying now that the ventilator is the wrong um, um, medical practice for somebody Understood, on this. but at what they knew at the time, what they, that data that they had, and the small businesses right. are hurting. And they're so unprepared, the, the governor office. If they say they're expecting so many cases, 200,000, way out of test. <clears throat> That's tough. Yeah, you see? so I mean, you know, uh, and it's not only, you know, it's the B and B that shut down, it's elective mm. surgeries you can't get any you know, yes. any anymore because Dental, everything, unless it's a real emergency. You, you can't get your teeth done. Else, uh, right, dentists are non essential. Non essential. Uh, and uh, Right, and so so you know, someone might say that the the, the decision to call a, a business essential or non essential would could have been arbitrary and capricious, sort mm -hmm. of random. Maybe. You know, maybe they had right. a good lobbying group. I don't know. Right. It, it is a. This is six feet. Mm -hmm. if you can well, do a job it, yeah. with six feet. Right, but it, and, and, and that came from the, the World Health Organization says that their social distancing is three feet, so all we did was double it. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Is that how it yeah, That's six how it to came ten about. feet. We even doubled. We just we, we, we doubled it to six feet, and yes. you know there there's there's ways to mitigate the risk. I mean, you know, as an individual person might say that I'm willing to take a risk that you're not willing to take, and that's your right to do that, hmm. right? There, there are people who drink too much alcohol. There are people who smoke. There are people who climb mountains. There are people who are, hmm. you know, go scuba diving. There are parachutists. There are people who, you know, have, a, have a, a, a higher, you know, risk tolerance. And that risk tolerance might be a lot. And, and, you know, young people might be saying, holy cow, there's nobody that's under 40 that's having, you know, getting, you know. But like you said, those might be the people that are serving me my Happy Meal. They, well, they, <laughs> they could I mean, be, but, right. So that's the risk. I mean, they may right. be more tolerant. They may not catch they, and get sick from the disease, but they may be carriers. Well, it, and it could be communicated. Uh, yeah, well, that, communicable part others. of it. Right, right. So, but, but it goes to the, it, it goes to the bottom line of, you know, what is, you know, what is practical with regards to not transmitting this? The cross-contamination. I mean, did you, mm. you've all probably seen the, the video of the, the uh, doctor from Michigan who was talking about going to, you wearing your gloves, going to uh, Kroger and uh, touching all the different cans because mm. you don't know where, who's touched that since it's come from the essential manufacturer, right? And then you answer your phone and you're texting on your phone and she was using some kind of, you know, die on, on the phone and she's putting it up to her face and by the time she's done she's scratched yeah, her nose and it's all over the but it's cross-contamination yeah. so I mean it, you can go you can infinitely you know drill down on this yeah. thing right. my debit card mm -hmm. handing my debit card to the person right. at the McDonald's <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's hard, it's hard. Mm -hmm. but saving life and making sure that we right. keep people healthy is yeah. top priority at that time that that was the top priority but I think it is time to start to reevaluate the situation. Yeah. Very well said, uh, Mr. Welch. And uh, certainly, as a trustee, we are we are we are all very concerned about our businesses in our township, uh, especially small business. They are not getting any help. Mm -mm. Uh, big box, of course, they they consider essential, like Kroger and all that. Yeah, uh, and uh, it, it just uh, breaks my heart when I see small business already close, and uh, they cannot revive. Even even though in my car payment, they even say, "Oh, we can uh, bypass it for a month." You know what? They just extend another month. They want no way. I won't do that. Yeah, you you're not getting waived for payment. You just extend it. So, 
Another point is uh, it's good that uh, Mr. Jones brought it up about social distancing. Yeah, we all need to be <coughs> mindful. But in uh, just like my case, I'm the first time grandfather. <laughs> you know, that little my uh, grandchild, I have to be very mindful, watch my hand, be very careful, stay away, I was told. They have no immune system practically. So like, like Mr. Wells said, this is all individual. Um, you know, you want to do the right thing and not going out to violate any type of uh, social distance, health and safety especially. And I hope that our governor will quickly coordinate with others and to get this, uh, uh, for the safety of people of course, but to get this business reopened quickly and safely. I think the discussion is, is um, the push to open our businesses is really mushrooming here most recently and maybe getting ahead of the um, authorities' ability to formulate a, a practical, prudent means of rolling out a, an opening of our businesses because it's not going to happen, boom, all at once. Right. We know that. And how to do it and do it prudently and effectively, um, they haven't gotten to that point yet. So we, we want it to be done to be done right. So there's a balancing act going on right now. Yeah. Uh, I, appreci I appreciate the push because um, uh, our businesses need it. But um, I'm, they, they discussed, uh, it, it's gonna be a local decision. How local, I don't know. But I would be interested, uh, Mr. Burks, if you could, uh, if you would please check with, uh, say, Westchester Hospital and get some history on, on admittance uh, for the uh, COVID-19. Um, how many positives have they had? Uh, have they had any deaths? Uh, I mean, where are, where are we locally in, on the issue? In, locally, uh, we're at uh, three deaths now, is in that correct? In Butler County. In Butler County. In Butler County. Butler County. I just yeah. bring it home to the local well, area here the, in the town. The, the issue with Westchester hospital. hospital is that it's such a regional draw and people from all around the region go to Westchester Hospital. Uh, and um, we may have people from, well, specifically Liberty, that may have the COVID that go to Westchester Hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure, um, I mean, I can, I can give uh, Tom D a call at Westchester Hospital and, and send him an email or- No, I didn't mean to suggest that it's gonna be exclusively within yeah. the boundaries of Westchester, because each hospital is gonna what, have that regional component, that yeah, regional see, draw. See what Westchester So there's Hospital, value in yeah. that. Yeah. We'll see what Westchester hospitals had admitted, treated, and released, and things of that nature. Yeah, correct. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Um, to your point, Bruce, the the folks that made the decision to do this may not have intentionally meant to injure small businesses. But there are, are, there are always unintended consequences to mm -hmm. things that you do, particularly when you do them in, with haste. And in this April 4th edition, Kroger sales surged 30% amid outbreak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These, are, these, are, these are small, what, they're, what I think they're doing, they're hastening the demise of small businesses because you know, people, people are creatures of habit and they, they shop where they habitually shop. And that place, that favorite place that you used to go may not open back up again. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in this, in this same uh, article, it indicates that probably half of the restaurants won't be open up in Cincinnati uh, uh, after this is over. Mm -hmm. and, and that 30% uh, surge is, is about in, within one month in, uh, uh, Kroger, the way I read it. Yeah, and, uh, right. Usually it takes people a year to get a surge, but. What percentage of that was in toilet paper? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, trying well, to lay it up what, I mean, you know, it's all. <laughs> yeah, it would, be, it would be difficult to predict the fact that dairy farmers had to dump milk because they have to milk their cows daily. Uh, that they can't store it and they were dumping milk uh, across the United States because of all the closures and they did not have a place to handle the, 
that is just one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side of that, you go to a computer store and they're carrying out game stations and they're not buying computers, they're buying entertainment stuff. Is, is that essential to the, I totally understand, but I also, I for one know what it's like to be in the driver's seat and make some decisions and be criticized for them. And I think uh, Governor DeWine and Dr. Acton are prepared to be criticized for them and they need to hear from you. And I think it's good that these letters are being sent because without the variety of extremes and opinions, you can't find the middle and you can't make really good sound decisions without it. Uh, because there is a lot of uh, major impact uh, half the businesses. Mm -hmm. I would, you, you say 43%, that's, I think that's I think a low number. Low. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, the unemployment rates and the people that are uh, struggling right now is, is uh, well, uh, it's remarkable in a negative way. Uh, the positives from this are the emphasis on transportation, uh, the emphasis on logistics and supply chain management, the emphasis on the things that matter are people and the people doing the work. Uh, uh, I think uh, we really opened our eyes about that. The ability to use technology when you'd never used technology before. So this is a real eye opener. Now to say we weren't prepared for it, I, 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 you know, I somewhat disagree with that. We've been, since 2010 at least, my research tells me that each community has a, uh, uh, community vulnerability index, and one of them is uh, disease, uh, pandemics. So to say we're not prepared, uh, then why does the CDC have an index for our ability to rebound from a pandemic? So uh, yeah, there's a lot of questions that are gonna come from this, and what's done is done, but uh, I know what it's like to be criticized, and we shouldn't be afraid to make our critique of this situation because it's likely going to happen again. So well, and that I mean, so okay, so that's the two trillion dollar question, right, right? Right. All they have to do is start saying pandemic, and you know how many times you shut your gun right. because this is the first time that we've ever shut the you know the the economy yeah. down for something like this, and and you know to live you have inherent risk, mm -hmm. and it's said that without risk you can't win. In fact. If you're playing not to lose, you can't win. If, we, if any of us who have been on a, on, a, on a sporting team and if the coach is telling us, hey, all you got to do is hold on, you know, just hold on. You're all playing need, to lose. <laughs> you, you will lose because you're not playing to win. You're playing not to lose. Mm -hmm. And that's, this, that's what this feels like to me. We're playing not to lose. Well, and, I think part of the issue here, uh, I'm sorry to pull from that, but I've seen our elected officials get bullied early, early on, and they'll pit one against another. I saw it on the 17th, March 17th, we were supposed to have our elections here in Ohio, and it was canceled. Mm -hmm. However, they had elections in Arizona, Illinois, and Florida. And it was on the 17th, the afternoon of the 17th, Harris Faulkner with Fox, uh, Fox News was interviewing uh, U.S. Senator Scott from Florida. He's a U.S. Senator. And she's asking him, she's pointing out how uh, Ohio canceled this election, and she said, why didn't Florida? <laughs> Aside from the fact that he's a U.S. Senator and he's not going to have any bearing on, you know, the education in, in the state uh, as far as canceling classes, it was very apparent, you can't do enough. And so it, it contributed to um, an overreaction, I think, on our elected officials. That's one of the take takeaways from this. Me, I'm not a fan of our, our media these days. I just have the worst things to say about them. And uh, I, you know, when you talk about uh, ABC did, uh, did poorly or MSNBC or whomever, I like the names of the specific individuals so that they can bear a personal accountability for what they did. And um, when it comes to the administration of the state and even the county and on down, uh, I agree with Trustee Becker. They're going off the best information they have and making 
the sound decisions from their position. So that's where the broad range of opinions can come in and we have to assess all the voices in this matter and, um, uh, and a variety of opinions can be shared about this and, there, and really uh, many of them even on opposite sides are right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, the, that's kind of the strange thing about this, you know. Uh, the prevention is right, but so is the need for our businesses to be open because it's straining other businesses uh, without, without a transportation company or a medical supply company, we can't have the, the needs met for the healthcare system. Well, I agree, and I don't think yeah. anybody's taking issue with yeah. our, our concern with uh, uh, heeding the best information we have. We're going yeah. to find out who provided good information, who provided poor information. Those sources are gonna be uh, credited accordingly. But um, I think the issue now is will we pivot? Mm. <clears throat> Uh, you, you know, and I'll say one more thing. I'm a little bit offended when they say we didn't, we weren't prepared for this. Well, we were. Rick, when I say we, I'm talking the fire department and the emergency management process that we have in place now. We are as prepared as we're going to be. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick. If you have a different opinion. Uh, so we do have processes in place to address really any emergency. And I think we're well prepared for this. We executed uh, Trustee them Becker very, is on, very well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've learned things along the way. I mean, we'll be better next time we have an emergency. As mm -hmm. in anything, the more experience, you gain more knowledge. But we did what we could do with what we had. And I think that level of wisdom is will carry us forward in this situation. Mm -hmm. There will be ramifications and unintended consequences. But yeah. we were trying to maintain the public health of all as many residents and Right. people as we could at the time. So, and, I, and it'll be in the history books. This will be debated for yeah. eternity. Yes, oh. yes. But, but what I don't want to see, but what I think I will see, is that there are sophists out there who, who are repugnant in their, in their viewpoint that they will say because somebody says, well, we should open up businesses. Well, do you want people to die? Do you want your employees to die? Do you want your, you know, your friend? Of course not. That's like saying, you know, if, uh, if, if, if my wife would die in a car accident, mm. I don't want cars on the streets anymore. Mm. It's, a, it, it's a ridiculous kind of connection that people try to make with that. Of course nobody wants death, but you know, like what Bruce said, it's a balancing act. This is, a, this is a, gonna be a $3 trillion thing to our economy mm. yes. that has never been done before. And there are, there's going to be lots of consequences to businesses that go out of business because I'm telling you, small business people, they have a, a, a higher risk factor and, and they're more entrepreneurial and they're going to put their house up as collateral for the, the triple net lease that they're signing on the bottom line for to open up their business. And they're going to find out they're like that lobster that walked into a cage and there's no way out but forward because mm -hmm. you can't back out. So there's going to be there's going to be there's going to be stuff that comes up, and this is going to be a grand experiment ten years from now when they look at this, and there's going to be a whole different way to look at it. If you're an analyst, this is going to be something great and to Historian. dive your mm -hmm. dive yeah. into, yeah. If they're not doing it already, I mean, like we are now, that's how it begins, right? <clears throat> Anything else, Lee? Did you have a, did you get no. a chance to address your issues? No, that's it. Well, I think it was, it was a good discussion. It was. We do have executive session tonight, so um, I'll entertain a motion to recess our regular meeting, go into executive session for the purpose tonight of considering the compensation of a public employee. Um, can I get a motion, please? I so move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yeah. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wall? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. We are in recess. We'll be back.
I'll entertain a motion to adjourn executive session and resume the April 14th, 2020 regular meeting. I should move. A second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Yeah, Mr. Wong? Yes. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. So we have concluded all of our action items and business, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the April 14th regular meeting of the Westchester Board of Trustees. I'll so move. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Jones, roll call, please. Mr. Welch? Yes. Mrs. Becker? Yes. Mr. Wong? Yes. We are adjourned. <laughs>